everybody, welcome to the world's greatest Bronze Age Spider-Man podcast. Here comes the Spider-Cast. I am your co-host, Mike Allen, as always, I'm joined by... Joshua Mervell, and today we're going to be taking a look at some of the crossover comics featuring Spider-Man from 1989. Yes, and we got G.I. Jolie with us. Woo! It's been a month! Yeah, it's, it's been, been a while, while, eh? Yeah. I yeah. miss everybody. <laughs> you miss the comic books. I miss Spider-Man. <laughs> really? Um, you say it like that, and I want to agree with you. But I actually do. I do. Okay, good. Good. It's That's funny great because to hear. We didn't read any Spidey comics. True. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Bless Sorry. you. Um. So here's the thing: we don't do research on this show, but just to give the <laughs> listeners a little bit of context, and to give GI Julie some context, and Joshua Marvell, I guess you probably need some context sure. for this, right? I'm not sure what you're talking about. Well, I know, like, so is this I'm not. A I need context yeah. for what I need context for. Is what so he, context. Well, so here's the thing: when Sat, when She Hulk was first created, she mm. was the Savage She Hulk. Right. Right. Mm. She. It was a typical action book, a typical action Marvel book. She was canceled. She joined the Fantastic Four. Then she joined the Avengers, or maybe I have that backwards. When this version came out, this was John Byrne having some fun with her because he wrote her in Fantastic Four, but he decided to make her a comedic character and have her character break the fourth wall and play around with, you know, meta humor and all whatever that's called, all that fun stuff. So that's what this basically was. Uh, now I'll also have, you know, an, a, a fun little backstory about the series is that <laughs> after only eight issues of being on the book, John Byrne quit this in a huff because he got into a dispute with editor Bobby Chase and he quit and left them in a lurch. And so they got Steve Gerber to fit in, the creator of mm. Howard the Duck. And in my opinion, the book got a lot better, but that's neither here nor there. But now we're going to have G.I. Jolie tell us what happens in this issue. Hi, kids. That's what he says on the cover, by the way. Yes. Um, it's <laughs> issue number mm-hmm. three. Like Mike was saying, it this issue was, quote, perpetrated by mm-hmm. John Byrne and uh, Bob Wojcik, um is uh, the inker. So John Byrne is the writer and the penciler. Funny, yes. Funny. Um, it's called My Guest Star, My Enemy. Mm-hmm. And okay, so we have Spider Man swinging around, which is weird because it's she, it's, it's a sensational, la 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 la. It's a sensational mm-hmm. She Hulk book. So to start with a big splash page of Spidey flipping around in New York. Yeah, New York. Okay, mm-hmm. I guess everyone's there. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, it's kind of cool. So he's doing his thing, and he runs into Mispe- Mysterio. Mysterio. He's just yes. got a suitcase full of money, and he's on his Mysterio cloud kind of making his getaway. Um, and then it kind of cuts to... Like, I don't really know why... I mean, you'll f- figure it out anyway. Okay, and it cuts to uh, two scientists, two very funnily shaped scientists <laughs> inside a laboratory um, with what looks to be She-Hulk on a slab. Um, they do not show you her face um, until the very last panel of Digital 4 and you f- you see that, oh boy, she's just a body. It's kind of mm-hmm. gross. And then... Um, uh, yeah, uh, it doesn't get better from here, guys. <laughs> um, her head, her, her. What do you call that when it's off of the body? Just decapitated. Well, dis- disembodied or disembodied. That okay. That's okay. I mean, it's both. It's been. I don't know. It's never clarified that it, she's been decapitated, but for sure she's disembodied. Um, when they illustrate her on Digital Five, she's talking to us and she's making jokes. Um, you and know, then she gets hit in the face with a pie. Yeah, so can I just say that that is that that hilarious meta humor I was talking about, where she's just talking to the reader. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's why it's like. The reader's not supposed to know that she's dis- a disembodied head at that point, but later you find out that's why she's 
it's just her head. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because she's like, this is supposed to be a funny book, guys. Um, mm-hmm. But like, you know, what are Spider-Man and Mysterio up to? Not a whole lot of fun, huh? And it's like, mm, no, I guess you're right. I mean, we did cut to you on a slab instead of following uh-huh. following the adventure, potentially. And then, whoop, pie in the face, because that is what 80s humor looks like. Um, well, I would and- argue that's what 60s humor looks like, but whatever. <laughs> this is a little out of date. I don't know. The way that she grimaces at the pie as it makes its way to her is kind of mm-hmm. like, you know, that's the kind of face I make at a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> she's annoyed by it, but she's like, wah, wah, I guess we'll go on with this story. So Spider-Man is just like, what are you doing, Mysterio? What are you doing with this giant suitcase full of, like, money and elastic bands? Because it's, I mean, he says paper, but because it, it, it's not really full of anything. Um... And then this is where it gets kind of hairy. Um, Mysterio is like, oh, shoot, this isn't real money. I've been duped. And that's it. He mentions somebody called the headman. The headman? The, he- the, the headmen head are, the, are the scientists. Oh, that's the why head, they're heads. The headmen. Specifically. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah, like okay. one guy's an ape with a human head one is a woman named ruby thursday with <laughs> just like a round um small ruby. like ruby as a head right. but it's like smaller than a human head and the other guy is like a normal guy but he has like a oh i think his skeleton is shrunk or something so his body's all flabby yeah yes and then there's yeah. one who is blue well, he's got a gorilla body that's so I'm not I'm body. it's confusing because I'm not sure what is the person and what isn't because mm-hmm. I was like, oh, OK, that makes sense. They're all just like heads and then they go and steal bodies. That's their whole shtick. Right. That's why oh. this guy, he has a gorilla body because he's the head. But then like the ruby girl, is her head just a ruby and she changes yeah. out her bodies? I'm confused as I to think what, so. what that even is. So is it more like a robot character that? person the ruby head i'm not sure yeah i'm not sure if they're humanoid or <coughs> betazoid or like right android i don't i don't know it's all very confusing it, it just sounds like they're all on the same it just seems as though they're on, all on the same side of uh harvesting so um it, they reveal that they're harvesting to the point where there's something named chandu with wings the feet of chicken Mm-hmm. Uh, the the sorry the horn of a unicorn, the wings of a mm-hmm. dragon, the feet of a chicken, and then tentacles. Yes. <laughs> he looks like sea cucumbers. It's disgusting. Yes, yeah, pretty um, gross. He kind of like it, their little creation gets out of control, and somehow uh, Spider Man gets involved, and he sort of, um, uh, you know. He jumps in the fray. They try to kind of like get the better of him. And in the midst of the fray, one of them opens a little door in the wall where you see the disembodied head of She Hulk. And Spidey sees that and he's like, Ooh, crap. Well, uh, hmm, she's my friend. I guess they know each other. Mm-hmm. So I don't know that, uh, yeah, I don't know how well they know each other, but he knows her enough to be like, Hmm. She Hulk's head. Uh, mm-hmm. The scientist six She Hulk's body after him, and then it cuts to another her talking um, to the audience. And then she's like, "Oh shoot, I don't have my body." And it's like, "Okay, uh, yeah. why? Why? We we knew this isn't even like a good joke." Um, and then it cuts to her head. Now now that the fourth wall being broken disembodied head joke is like has been revealed uh, that it's been her head in that hole the whole time talking to us all along. Um, it cuts to her sort of like looking at her body fighting Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. And um, it looks like he's losing this battle. Now they cut again to a woman something called the sea pole building the municipal building shit 
Jeez. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, um. <laughs> the right, she... <laughs> well, you know what? Let's point out that's bad lettering. Like the letter yeah. should have made that one word on one line, not split it up. That's just stupid. Yeah, that's weird. Because I thought it was just one of those weird Marvel acronyms. And also, mm. I skim read this because it was right. You can, I think you can tell by the tone of my voice that I was like really excited for this, but like uh-huh. ultimately disappointed. Um, mm-hmm. So she also talks. This woman is handing something like police bulletins to this gentleman. Do we learn his name? We do. Um, I'm trying just trying to find it really quick, Mister Towers. I don't know who Mister Towers is, um, but he's in the he's in the building, and uh, she. It's weird because like. I, I actually kind of really like this part because she handed him a police bulletin and said, he's like, well, what do I need this for? And she's like, well, how are the reader, reader supposed to know what comes next mm-hmm. if you don't read this? And I was like, okay, I kind of like that. <laughs> uh, that's something in comics and like you, whatever, in literature that is always really neat. Uh, when, uh-huh. when characters address, like Bill Willingham did it a lot in Fables where characters are the quote writer. Um, addresses the reader as if they are a character in, in the book. Um, and then other characters like, who are you talking about? It's it's brilliant and beautiful. Um, okay, so this is where it kind of gets, just in case you didn't think Chandu was wild, it gets wilder. So the nuttiest of the professors, um, turns out he has been on the slab as well. And... Uh, he he's he wants to seal She-Hulk's body, and wouldn't you know, he's able to lock necks. <laughs> so he is now like he rips off his lab coat, and he's She-Hulk. Um, and uh, from the hole in the wall, She-Hulk's head is like, dude, this is gross. Like you're not gonna win. Um, Spider-Man is here to save the day, and wouldn't you know, he does. He knocks. <clears throat> the nutty professor's head off of her body and is able to reattach no 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 he doesn't reattach her body um they do something really weird they cut to the chase yeah they cut to bobby chase the editor this this was annoying to me yeah um <laughs> this, yeah uh. and then um he he He's swinging through the air with She-Hulk. This is the part that got confusing to me after they cut to Bobby Chase. She, there's a tank. Because they're getting away. So, they're, so what's happening is they say, let's cut to the chase because they're going to, they kind of like jump to the exciting stuff. So, they don't show the bad guys getting away in their big tank. They're like, let's just cut to the chase. This is the story about what happened. They're getting away, and Spider Man swung me in front of the the thing, and I destroyed it. So that's so she, she as she Hulk as the narrator is saying, you know what? Let's cut to the chase, literally, and get get past all this boring shit, and I'll show you how this story ends. Okay, can I also cool. can I also yeah. point so out I, that I. Mm-hmm. I did not understand if it was always a clone, if it was always an android. So that at this point is what is the worst part about the story. Right. For sure. So, but it, apparently at this point, the head of She-Hulk, I thought the head of She-Hulk was, was like, like an Android head, but she is implying yeah. in this scene that she's the real She-Hulk. I don't know how she can be it on that little It doesn't make sense. Scene. Right. Yeah. And then in the, the next page, she has a real body back. So I don't understand if she broke out of that and, little contraption or if she, her head was attached. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And then... The, like she also says that there's no way that there's anything powerful enough to even cut through her skin to cut off her head. So so it's like, what was that floating head then? So right? that's the thing is I don't, the only thing that makes sense is if the head is not floating, the body is a clone, but in the next scene she's in her real body. So that means she was never detached from her real body. Exactly. Or like, it doesn't make sense. They, yeah. They could have, they yeah. could have fixed this with one thing and i honestly really liked this story besides the the fact that like the ending really kind of blew it for me with the the whole revealing like oh it was just a clone <laughs> yeah it's like well, what the they could have just 
explained away with like sci-fi technology that they don't actually chop anybody's head off. They put that contraption on their neck and it teleports their head somewhere else. Good so point. their head is still like connected to the body, but it's just like teleporting it somewhere else. They need uh-huh. a live body to be able to control it with their heads. So they didn't actually cut her head off. It's just in another spot. The second the device is turned off, her head reappears. You know what I mean? Like anything yes. like that yes. where, well, where it's just kind of like, oh, this tech that they have is you're able to detach the head. That's it. Also, G.I. Julie has technically not finished summarizing the plot. So the sure, still, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. there's still a few pages to go. <laughs> it's done now. You guys I mean, yeah, well, we kind of, we yeah, basically they fight the headmen, defeat them, and that's it. And yeah. then, yeah, and then there, I got to admit, there's one really cool scene. You kind of mentioned it earlier, but She-Hulk asks, how did you know this was a clone body? Maybe you didn't mention it. And, she, and he goes, simple. When I peeked inside the control collar, I found a tiny little vest, is it vestigial? Vestigial vestigial head and you see like it almost looks like a like a metal like bowl with like all these contraptions and wires and shit and a tiny little like head the size of like a marble it's fucking gross and i love it that is cool (laughs) so here's the thing um anyone who you know i'm somewhat of an influencer no i'm not anyway um (laughs) but uh anyone who knows me on social media knows that i dislike john byrne for many reasons but Ooh, this was okay. The art was pretty good. It's before he began his long decline into amateurness. This was okay, not great art. The story was, ugh. I mean, okay, fine. It's supposed to be funny. It's supposed to be whatever. But the thing I don't like about that is it, it's almost like he's using that as an excuse to have very crappy plots and cliched mm-hmm. situations. And then he can just say, oh, well, it's okay. It's a comedy. But it was a fairly entertaining story. But I didn't really think it was great. And, you know, the fact that we were confused about a huge plot point kind of proves that he didn't really think it through. It's to the point that I also wonder if he finished the story and then went back and rewrote that one little part. Because yeah. if, you, if you just look at the art, it's like, oh, she put her he- head back on the body. That's what happened. But he just fixed it with dialogue. That's what I think happened. <laughs> Yeah, or maybe like they they had this whole thing written out, and then the editor was like, right. "You can't do this. Her, she's she's a Hulk. How right. how are exactly. they supposed to cut off her head?" Kind of thing. So exactly, they had right. to be like, "Who's a clone?" No, no, no. I don't know. I really liked it up until the ending. I thought it was pretty fun to jump into She Hulk, and She Hulk is like missing. We're like following Spider Man, who is a character that everybody's familiar with. Even for that, even for the eighties, before like all these movies and everything, he's like super mainstream now. But everybody knows who he is then, so we can kind of like just jump into a story with him, and then right. uh, it also like introduces to new readers that She Hulk breaks the fourth wall, yeah, which is really fun. So like we see her, and she's like, eh, "I know it's kind of scary. Uh, my head's decapitated, but maybe I'll tell you a joke." And so it's like. It pushes you right into that humor and uh, introduces you to, like, what this type of story is. Uh And uh, Spidey, like, defeating one of his classic villains right away. And then that just kind of leads him to, like, the real story is also really fun. And then the, the idea of these guys that, like, use, like, put their heads on other people's bodies and control it is so fun. Yes. Um, I don't necessarily think it's like super thought out which i think could be fine and forgivable if the story like if the story was fun and cohesive everywhere else like is it does it ruin the story that i don't know who the real person is the ruby or the this woman's body no but like it's I don't know. It, it was really fun. I, I enjoyed reading it and then was kind of disappointed by the end, I felt. Right. But. One other thing, the, the headmen were created by Steve Gerber, coincidentally, who took over for She-Hulk after John Byrne quit. So hmm. he, we have to give credit to the headmen to him because they're, I think they're from the Defenders. Okay. But anyway, yeah. But yeah, anyway. They, they are. The Defenders are mentioned uh, in the, the start of the book. Right. Uh, I think Spider-Man says their name. Right. And just to be clear, the, the technically this character is called She-Clone, and she has her own entry on marvel.fandom.com. 
Dear Lord. But anyway, pardon me, G.I. Julie, so what did you think of the story of what you read of it anyway? <laughs> God. Um, oh, fuck, it was terrible. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I just... <laughs> There's silence right now for a reason. I just mm. like I'm exhausted all the time anyway, but like this was really hard <laughs> to get through. Uh-huh. There's just so much um like if this like if this was written today. The whole right. idea that like th- the women are decapitated is just it's signaling something to me that I'm sure I read in like you know philosophy 101 you know uh-huh. there's just there's a symbolism there that is uh it's sort of i don't want to talk about it it's just it's just it's that woke bullshit <laughs> that people expect to come just falling out of my mouth but um yeah there, there's just something to be said about like i like I, I thought okay whatever it's excusable maybe maybe um the writer is just writing without like knowing what you know um the like the the body politics that they're inadvertently uh-huh. Uh-huh. Sort of writing about uh-huh. but then when the story's done thank god the story is done you get to the mailbag and it's called she mail mm. so that didn't age well either she male. Yeah. Cool. Well, I mean, the character's name is She Hulk. Is there another meaning to the word she male? Oh, like she male? Yeah. Like, like it like wasn't M-A-L-E. even cool to use that word before. Mm. Well, that's assuming it's a pun on M A L E. Is that what you're saying? It is a pun okay. on M A L E because email didn't <sighs> exist in. Mm the 80s so it can't be a pun on email email whatever do you know what didn't Mm. do you know what didn't have to age and was kind of cool that i really did like about this book was that the very first letter is from chris claremont holy moly dear bobby et al one of the great and guilty pleasures about working in the industry in quotations is that you get to work you get to see work before it's published so he read the first three issues of she hulk uh-huh. Uh, this sensational first. Uh, both pleasures apply to John Burns' She-Hulk. I got to cheat. I've seen the first three issues and they're fun. Uh, wow. I'm paraphrasing. I've seen the first three issues. They're fun. Some of the most enjoyable stories John has crafted. Did he pay him to say that? <laughs> <laughs> as much well- delight to read as I hope they were for him to write and draw. I can't see. wait to see what happens next. Chris Claremont, New York, New York. That's cute. The sad yeah. thing is, is that if John Byrne had the chance, he would have shit-talked Chris Claremont because that's all he ever has done in the past 40 years. But anyway, because he's an <laughs> asshole. But anyway, um, so yeah, but it was a nice letter. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like Chris Claremont right after C2E2, his schedule just wide open now. That's true. That's yeah. true. He's canceled. Anyway, uh, <laughs> not on, not by us, but anyway. Um, I know. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. I'm not going to. Yeah. So anyway, uh, getting back to this, Josh, mm-hmm. you seem to liked, to have liked it more than G.I. Jolie and I. Yeah. Uh I I like the beginning. I like the setup of everything. Again, that ending is so awful. It it really blows. Um, I even like the the gag of like cutting to the chase. That's that works for me. You know what I mean? Like a, it's like suppo- yeah. it's like trying to be uh-huh. that like old like goofy like dad humor. Sure. So it it completely works for me. Um, and I think that she Hulk is so charming that she pulls it off. I find, well, I don't know why I I buy it from her more than I buy it from like Deadpool, for example. Um, I think, I think some of the, some of the times it feels just too like sticky coming from Deadpool. Uh, maybe cause I, I, I'm 
it's like more popular with him. But seeing it with She Hulk, I don't know. If there, there's just something about how charismatic she is and her like power set and like her being a lawyer, just like an everyday yes. kind of job. It, it just it works for me. Um, so all in all, I did enjoy it. Uh, it's a bummer how it left <laughs> how it left off, but. Uh, uh, yeah, no, I, I kind of liked it. Ooh. Well, yeah, I didn't hate it. Um, you know, I do find She-Hulk definitely appealing, like the, this version of She-Hulk appealing. I don't mind breaking the fourth wall, but I, I just find it a little bit um, superficial and kind of throwaway. But I guess mm. that's fun. I, it's fine if you want to do a comic like that, as long as it's enjoyable. So on that level, I think it works. I definitely don't hate it. I just think it's kind of um inconsequential put it that way yeah for sure i yeah. i don't think that this is a a must read by right. by by any means uh, right. but it had some fun moments i also kind of liked this is one of the only times i think that spider-man was written well in a uh, a guest appearance right normally he's written like he's like a goofy like young 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 teenager like Mm-hmm. A hip, what like what like the old folks think a hip young kid would talk. Sure, like it, I think that he's written really well. He's drawn super fun too, yeah. and really works for the style. When he's like peeking over the side of the building, looking at Mysterio, his right. feet are planted flat on the ground, and he's like almost falling over the building, and he's bent yeah. over at the hip. That's super fun. Um, I don't think it necessarily works for like. A Spider-Man comic, like the visual of it, but in sure. She-Hulk, t- her kind of like retelling this story almost, yeah. and like the vibe of everything, it completely works. So there's, yeah, there's a lot of fun stuff in this issue, but uh, it's definitely not a must read, right? But I, I enjoyed it. You know, I want to, I, I want to add to that that I actually like the way John Byrne draws Spider-Man here, like because John Byrne's anatomy is not perfect he can kind of cover it up with uh you know he like all the webs and then Mm. he also makes spider-man's blue areas mostly black in this like there's a lot of dark spots Mm -hmm. so it it makes it it makes his spider-man appealing and it's funny because before the 90s john Byrne never had a run on spider-man that was one of the things people always wondered like how come he's never done a long run oh i I guess he did marvel team up that's true he did marvel team up with chris claremont for a couple years Mm. but um yeah this was when John Byrne was good. Unfortunately, if you remember, he did the Spider-Man Chapter 1 in the 90s. Did you ever read that? It was brutal. It was brutal. It was when he mm. redid his origin and changed it. and it I was, don't it remember was, that. It, it was really bad. But anyway, yeah. so this was decent. So, G.I. Julie, I guess the last question is, what did you think of the art in this one? It was great. She Hulk's beautiful. Mm-hmm. I kind of love her. I see why Ricky Lima is, like, obsessed. Yeah, I mean, my favorite yeah. color is already green. So, like, mm-hmm. like I love her hair. I love her smile. Um, I love that she's tallest woman in the whole room. Like, right. And, like, I don't know. I, I, I really enjoyed the art. I, yeah. It, yeah, oh, it, it, sorry. it didn't, like, distract from the story. Right. And John Byrne does have, know how to draw appealing-looking looking women. Like, she has, like, a pleasant face. Like, she's charming and mm-hmm. appealing you know yeah yeah, yeah it's very she, like oh sorry josh oh, i was gonna say she looks like she hulk like right. it, it's very recognizable if you take the green color it off of the the page it still looks like her good mm-hmm. point um which is not something you can say about a lot of female characters like right. a lot of women in comics around this time especially in like the beginning of the 80s when we first started reading spidey it's like Every like woman character that was drawn was drawn as like the same woman character with like long blonde hair and like an hourglass figure, and they all like in a lineup you couldn't tell who was who. Mm-hmm. Right, right, so, right, right. Yeah, yeah, it's an actual character. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you know? I, okay, I didn't so, like this issue. However, I probably will read number one and two. I should also point out, mm. just so you know, that not only does uh, Steve Gerber take over writing with issue 10, the artist starting issue 9 is none other, none other than Brian Hitch. 
of oh, the Ultimates ulti- fame and other big famous things fame. So yeah, Brian Hitch. There you go. <laughs> and uh, other things. Yeah. So we're gonna give it a. Uh, I guess if I would give it a number, I don't know. I guess I'll give it a six out of ten. Josh. Yeah, I think a six fits it. Um, it's a. It's very fun. Nothing consequential. Art great. Um, yeah, six. <laughs> GI Jolie. Uh, yeah, I give it a. Six out of ten empty briefcases. What the heck was Mysterio doing? He's so stupid. <laughs> uh, yeah, the less said about that, the better. <sighs> I tried to be nice, so I don't want. To, I don't want, want to remember that. I plot. assume. I assume that's where they got the android clone of She Hulk. Right? It was from Mysterio, oh. and they gave him. They paid him and gave him the money for it, and they paid him with fake money. Right? That's what I got from it. Mm. Okay. Josh okay. got more out of this than me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, okay, so now so, we mm-hmm. are going to move on to Daredevil, the man without fear, number 270. Right. This uh, is drawn by our old pal, John Romita Jr., who did Amazing Spider-Man from about, I don't know, 225-ish to 251. And then before that, he did scattered issues. I think after that, he might have done... Oh, after that, he did one or two issues, definitely. He did the issues where Peter proposes to Mary Jane. So he's right. a veteran. This is arguably John Romita Jr. at his peak. Um, a lot of people don't like John Romita Jr., but whenever they criticize him, I always point them directly to Daredevil because this is where he was inked by Al Williamson, who's kind of famous for his very realistic art style um, on things like the Star Wars daily comic strip and stuff like that. And he really... Uh, has a way of fleshing out John Romita's pencils and making them kind of more palatable to a general audience, which I don't need. But anyway, it looks awesome. Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, I'm kind of an expert at comics. And uh, and, uh, and Anosenti, who, if you guys remember, wrote "What's the Matter with Oh, sorry, Life in the Mad Dog Ward." You remember that story? Yes. Yeah. Where Spider-Man was locked up in a psych ward. That makes sense. We have mixed feelings about Andosenti. We're not going to talk about those mixed feelings, but we are going to talk about this issue. It's a very weird one. Very weird, okay? It opens up with a murdered woman in 1658 laying on the top of this hill. And basically the narration describes how this hill kind of became like a cursed hill. And like over time, the people around the hill kind of knew that you know, bad things happen there and stay away from there. Don't play near the hill. And then over these two or three splash pages, we see, you know, these thorns growing on the hill. And there's all this like purple prose, strange plants twisted with a melancholy beauty, romantic, tragic roses with a thousand thorns for every blossom. You know, if you're into that thing, it's cool. Then all of a sudden it's present day and we see a couple uh, running through like a meadow and they're going up to this hill and it looks like the thorns are kind of like almost growing around them or going after them. And it looks like this guy is getting fresh with this girl and she's trying to push him off, but he won't, he's not having it. And then all of a sudden, Krakum, something appears from inside the hill. A being that looks like, how would you describe him? A humanoid with black skin and thorns growing out of him. Mm-hmm. And like, I don't, almost like a big lion's mane, but it's all black. And right. this is Blackheart. We have no idea who he is yet. I think because this is his first appearance, actually. Okay. And he comes out of the hill, and he's all cool looking, and he and he basically takes a one look at this couple and sizzles uh, Kazrak, zaps them <laughs> and kills them. This is pretty gruesome. Remember, this is 1989 Marvel Comics. Th- these this couple is reduced to a pile of like bones, like a skeleton. And then all of a sudden appearing behind him, oh, look who it is. It's Mephisto. Finally, we found him. Re, yeah, redesigned by um, John Romita Jr. Mephisto always looks the same, except for this storyline by John Romita Jr. He completely redesigned him to look almost like, um, I don't want to say horse-like, but he gave him like this weird face. Like if you look at other issues around this time, Mephisto looks completely different from when it went any other appearance. So yeah. anyway, we find out that Mephisto is Blackheart's son. And Blackheart has kind of just been created, I think. And and at this point, Blackheart can't talk. And you mean so Blackheart is his son? 
Is Mephisto's son, mm-hmm. yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Sorry, did I say that wrong? Yeah. Mephisto is his father. Got it. And um, so then this, so he's congratulating his son for killing the couple. And then the second thing Blackheart tries to do is to kill Mephisto. And he's like, hey, take it easy. <laughs> easy. <laughs> and then he changes his appearance to make Blackheart look more um, human. And then basically sends him off into the world. And then we cut over to Daredevil, who's daredeviling. He's just kind of swinging around on a roller coaster, having fun at like an amusement yep. park. Thinking to himself about how his life sucks, because his life always sucks. And uh, and then all of a sudden, Blackheart kind of spots him, right? And then he attacks. And then meanwhile, we cut over to Peter Parker, who's still on tour for the Webb's book. So I'm not sure when exactly this issue takes place, but who cares, right? Let's just enjoy it. And so anyway, we cut back over to Blackheart, who has a tail. And he's like <laughs> shooting things at uh, Daredevil. Kazak, Kazak, Kazak. And Daredevil's fighting back with his billy club. He's fighting, fighting. And then like the roller coaster is getting hit and it's falling over and it completely collapses. And the, there's all these people watching. And then Daredevil's like kicking him in the face, Vok, Chalk, Crack, punching him, punching him. Then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, here comes Spider Man. Ta da! Hi, DD. Who's your ugly friend? Right? Kicks him in the face. He's helping him fight him. He picks up something really heavy. Oh, it's like a, I don't know what that is, it's like a snack stand. And like hits <laughs> and like drops it on Blackheart. And uh, then look, like him and Daredevil, or Spider Man and Dare, Daredevil, sorry, Daredevil, are kind of like quipping back and forth. And they're trying to figure out how to defeat Blackheart. Spider Man punches him. And, uh, and Daredevil's tail. like, what's that? Yeah, there's his tail. No, you and, pull uh, his tail to defeat him. I'm kidding. Oh, okay. <laughs> and um, so then you can see all the people watching and um, they're trying to figure out what's going on. And then uh, they're like, well, how do we kill it, right? And then uh, and then they get the idea. I don't remember what they do here. They Did they try to electrocute him? Yes. I don't, yeah, they try to electrocute him. So they punch him and then he explodes. <laughs> Wait a minute. This can't be right. Where do they electrocute him? Oh, because there's a... Is, is it a fence? It's kind of confusing here. I can't here. even remember. Yeah. Let's see here. Spider-Man, you see what I could do? You mean kill it, but we can't just... What's our choice? What if it attacks those people? Um. So, yeah. So, basically, I think it's that the fence is electrified. And then they punch him into the fence? It's kind of confusing. Yeah. Daredevil's like, I could kill him. And Spider-Man convinces him not to kill. Right. Um, and then Spider-Man kind of like takes <clears throat> out Daredevil and then punches um, punches him in the tail. Right. Yeah, they yeah, they they decide to not they're trying to knock him out, so they punch him together, and then a crowd shows up. Mm-hmm. And then whatever his name is, is like, oh, yeah, that's right. Mephisto said not to be seen by any humans. So he just leaves. <laughs> so they don't even really defeat him. It's just that I know. people show up and... It's kind of anticlimactic. It kind yeah. of just ends, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, um... that's the story here is this guy shows up, uh, fights Spider-Man and Daredevil, and he gets scared that people are going to see him, and he leaves. It's not much of an ending. Um, but the, the other little tiny subplot is that Spider-Man gets the feeling that Daredevil doesn't really care if he dies at one point. He kind of, in one of his thought bubbles, he thinks that, right? Mm-hmm. He's like, huh, Daredevil seems kind of self-destructive or something. And again, it's because Daredevil's whole life has been torn apart by the Kingpin. But that's pretty much the end of the story. Um, again, I always have mixed feelings about Andal Senti's writing. Some things I love about it. Some things I don't. It's it's definitely a weird issue. And again, like we said, it, it doesn't really end. It kind of just fizzles out. So, ooh, I have mixed feelings about the story. But uh, GI Julie, I want to know what you think. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So, I I agree. It's it's really strange. She's. She's not like an abstract writer, but it almost is like surreal. Um, like, I don't know how vividly the, either of the two of you dream, but it's like one of those things where like you're t- being taken on a ride. Um, the kind of dream ride where things change and you can't uh, 
like you you can't control mm. the path like you are with people or you're in a house and you open a door and you can't control whether that door puts you into the outside world or not you just have to go through it and you do and like you could be staring at a field but you could then end up in a basement and that's how it felt this story just felt like the, you, it was un, completely unpredictable in like mm-hmm. the worst possible way and um, like in a, in a nightmarish kind of way no, and no, even nightmares make a little bit of sense, you know, because they're yeah. part of they're part of your psyche. This is not part of my psyche. It's like mm-hmm. it's yeah. Um, I like the whole idea that Spider Man's like well, they like they use like these kind of lofty theory sort of type things to explain away not Mephisto, the other one. Blackheart. Blackheart disappearing. Right. He was, but he's, Daredevil's like, um, he's still out there. Like, it's not like they totally dismiss it. Mm. But then Spider-Man's like, but they're all still out there, Dee Dee. That's what mm-hmm. evil is. It's always present. And I'm like, wow, really? In a Daredevil comic, is it always this heady? With Innocenti it is. Okay. The th- you know, here's the thing. This is what I think about Angel She's Senti. a lot. <laughs> well, you know, I, G.I. Jolie and I, you know, we've read a lot. We've we reviewed a lot of, um, like, indie graphic novels at Nerdy Book Club. And the consensus that I came to with myself was that <laughs> a lot of really popular <laughs> graphic novels, uh, they f- read like uh, like first-time <laughs> directors indie indie films where it's like yes you're yeah. talented yes you're good yes you have great ideas but you need to refine those ideas mm-hmm. and i feel like because Anno senti had zero comic book background when she was hired her strength is she's not influenced by marvel or dc comics she's not influenced by superheroes mm. uh but her strength is that she's probably smarter than the average marvel writer she's probably more well educated her, her strength is her gender because most of the Marvel writers at the time were male. In fact, I think all of them were except Louise Simonson. But her weakness is, is that maybe she doesn't have as much experience writing actual stories. So she's got all these great ideas and she has a unique point of view, right? And she has a new, unique voice, but she doesn't know how to um, sculpt that into a story. And that's probably the area where she needs help mm. or refinement, you know? Well, cut back to Blackheart. And he's got his tail. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I wonder if this is um, uh, their crack at a Sandman type story. Oh. Because Sandman ju- had just come out in January of the same year. So yeah. I'm curious to see if they wanted to take because the even the, the art looks very similar for both Mephisto and Blackheart. Um it's almost like a like a an avatar for like a thing, right? Like mm-hmm. uh-huh. Mephisto is like the avatar of death or like the devil. Blackheart is like one of his like offspring that it like represents like darkness in your heart i i assume since his name is blackheart Black he's heart. like he's like depressed and taking lives and like has these like weird omnipotent powers uh and like it's also like trying to be deep with like the poetry at the beginning and the artsy mm. like style so i'm wondering if it's their kind of like answer to this yeah. story that had just come out um but i i I think I would have been more okay with this like very abstract issue because there's not really much of a story going on. Mm-hmm. I, I I would have been more okay with it if there was a reason for it to be more like abstract and weird. Mm-hmm. But the beginning, we see this dude, he's like killing people and then his dad shows up and he's like, ah, ah, ah you can't do that. You're only allowed to do that if you find somebody that's worthy to fight you and and match your power. So this guy waited like years and years and he found 
Daredevil, <laughs> the blind guy, and said, yup, that's it. I think I'll <laughs> fight this literal just human dude. <laughs> this is worth this is worth it for me to reveal myself. That guy. And then Spider-Man shows up and he can't even fight the two of them together and he disappears again. Like there's no like I don't know. It it, it doesn't feel like there is like a reason for him to reveal himself like maybe if he fought somebody that he thought would be an even match and he's like trying to prove himself and then ends up failing like that even might be enough to be like this is this weird fun abstract story that we're telling but it doesn't even make sense that he shows up on earth to fight this dude right. at, a, at a fair like it just I, I don't know well i didn't like this issue you know here's the thing that there's like a rule in story why now like why does this story have to happen now and there's nothing specific about what daredevil's doing or what mephisto's doing or what spider-man's doing that makes the story like that necessitates this story happening the way it does right Mm -hmm. so it's it's some cool ideas but yeah it needed to be completely rethought completely top to bottom now, mm-hmm. I have a little factoid for you guys. Oh, yeah. Okay. And I'm sending it in the chat here. And I oh, want to show you see. the actor that played Blackheart. Can you see that picture? Oh, are you kidding me? That's Yes, oh. in the Dare in the Ghost Rider movie. That is that's right. He yes. is Meph- and Mephisto is in the movie too. Yes, Mephisto's played by Peter Fonda. Isn't that right. cool? I completely forgot. I didn't realize that was even him. Yeah, and I own it on Blu-ray. Jolie, what are your thoughts about that? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Mike. I think they yes. really... Uh, <laughs> Sorry for your loss. ...missed the boat when they didn't... Because he looks like Keanu Reeves. He even looks like um, Morpheus. You know what I mean? Like This guy? I, no, no, A little no, bit. No, 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 no. That guy just looks like... You know, I know him from <laughs> that Wes Craven movie where they're vampires. In the, you mean the one called Vampires? Is that what it's called? Probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think so. But let me look it up, though. Oh, no, no, no. Sorry. I'm thinking of John Carpenter's vampires. Wes Craven's is called... Mm, Dracula? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Vampire in Brooklyn? No, that no. can't be right. What um, the hell so am his, I... No, sorry. His name is Wes something or other. I, I'm I'm okay. just amalgamating everything anyway, from the okay. late 90s, early 2000s. Um, mm. He's... <sighs> I love this guy. He's hilarious. He's part of that, like, she's all that era of actors. Yeah, like of course. Paul Walker mm-hmm. and right. Rachel Lee Cook. And, like, uh, maybe his name is Ben. I can't remember. But he's cool. I'll look it up. I don't but I know him as a black heart, though. I know him from um, American Beauty. Is he remember? the boyfriend? He, he was the guy in the other house who, remember, he was the one that stared at the plastic bag and I was like, I only remember. Sometimes. Mina Suvari covered. He's the, the he, his famous quote is sometimes I think there's so much beauty in the world I can't even take it. That's his quote. Oh, cool, he's dude. Plastic bag guy. Yep. Oh shoot. Okay. Good. Good. Good for him. <laughs> anyway, Good. I think that they really um, there there really was a missed opportunity within. I mean, his hair is spiky. The mm-hmm. viewers, the listeners can't see the photo of Wes but his hair is spiky in that weird like mm-hmm. your hair is just a little bit too long spikiness like mm. everybody in the early 2000s almost all men who went to not stylists and just barbers all had like hair that was yes Mike is pointing at himself Wait, just so I feel you know. attacked hold on mm. okay <laughs> anyway you should feel attacked this was your hair for five years of me knowing you yeah I know Anyway, and every I don't, I don't, day you'd be like, does my hair look all right? And I'm like, it looks the same as yesterday. Which it wasn't which, good yesterday and it's not good today. <laughs> which means it was great. Yeah, Fuck. exactly. <laughs> anyway. Awesome. But anyway, it looked like that, but strawberry blonde. Mm. Um, but now everybody, he looks like Jesus. So it's different now. It's different. Um, Those for our listeners that don't know what we look, what we look like. Look like. Mm-hmm. Mm. Anyway, Josh looks like Magnum PI. <laughs> Mag- yeah. <laughs> Not Tom Selleck, Magnum PI specifically. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I need I just need to put on a like, like a floral shirt. Wine shirt. shirt. Yeah. yeah. You got shirts? I do. Okay. I usually do wear them actually. <laughs> so, okay. So. 
Let's oh, yeah. finish up our review. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Hold it's on a second. We got to think about the, the art. Issue. I was gonna well, say I, I like the art. I yeah. okay. I love. I mean, John Romita Jr. is one of my favorite artists, and this is his, in my opinion, one of his peak periods with Al Williamson inking. We did read a scan, so it's hard to tell. Like, I don't know if they're like photocopying the original, what they're doing. The lines looked a little bit thick, but the actual art is great. And this G.I. Julie, you scan? agree? It's a digital. Um, it's a digital. Is this a version digital? Of a no, no, that's what I mean. But like, what I'm saying is, when they create the digital version, are they going from They're the going... original art? Because uh, the lines I always look like. like nano. What's the word for a small meter? Um, like they look like a pentometer bigger <laughs> than the original line. Whatever that word is. Like, do you agree with me? Like the lines look like slight. You know when you photocopy something, and the lines get thicker. Right. Like yeah, I'm talking like about bleeding, 80s photocopies. Yeah. This looks like slightly thicker than my brain remembers it to be. And I can only assume it's because, yes, it's a, it's a digital version, but it's a... It's like a you know, recolored... Hmm. So they work from the inks, I'm assuming. The, um, and it, it's a high contrast ink, and then they recolor yes. it. Yes. So that's what. Pop, that's what... Yeah, Josh will know. When you uh, boost the contrast... Josh is like, will I? Like, mm. Do I know? Yes. <laughs> You're familiar with graphic design. When you, no, but you bump up the yeah. contrast on something that's already black and white, the blacks get thicker. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly uh, what's I, happening here. I would like to do an interview with a creator, uh, like a professional, and find out exactly how they do these scans because that even be really Josh... Interesting. I, I remember a couple years ago you said that um, they touched up the art and I was like, no, I don't! But... It's not that I think it's touched up, but I mean, we have, you know, like the McFarlane originals, I have them and I know they look different. I know Mm -hmm. that the the inks are finer in the originals. So to me, yeah, it must be some type of scan where they probably take the the scan and they go, okay, knock out all of the colors. But in order to do that process, they have to, like Jolie said, pump up the blacks, right? Mm -hmm. In order to eliminate the colors. And that's what makes it thicker, I think, right? They don't work from scans. Well, they have to scan something, though. They do, and yeah. it's the inks. Um, You're saying they take but, like, the but black and white. But that's still going to bump that contrast up, whether they're scanning yeah. the original or the or the print, right? Yeah. So wait a minute. Okay, I, I know what you're saying now. Like, Even if they scan a black and white page, they still have to up the contrast a little bit, or you're going to have kind of like a grayish yeah. paper, I see, yeah, which so, is still going to affect the inks. Okay. Um, yeah. Jose Villarubia on Facebook has devoted much of his Facebook presence to like sort of like Facebook blogging about recoloring. Mm. Interesting. And what he'll do, he's actually talked about how uh, these recolors, the process of the recoloring, and more often than not, they do work from scans of the inks if they have them available. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I. <clears throat> I definitely know, you know, the older you go, like, say, 70s, 60s, and then back, it gets harder because those pages are lost forever. So sometimes mm-hmm. they are using, like, actual comic book pages. Um, I know that when they did the DC archives in the late 80s, I think they were taking original comic book pages and bleaching the color out, then scanning it. This is before computers. Wow. They had, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? But Yeah. Yeah, so it was... Um, and that's what they they would at some points they would have to like redraw things and there's differences in the art and all that stuff and so that's why for example like flash gordon there are versions of the flash gordon comic strip reprinted where it's like this it looks like this daredevil comic then there's versions where they just take a sunday strip and scan it and the colors are mismatched you can see the um dots but sometimes that's kind of in a way closer to the original yeah you know did you say that you hated this one josh Yes. Okay. The story. The story. I, I think the art is great. Um, per- particularly, like, the beginning and the end. Um, this style really works for this, like, drab, like, otherworldly demon story that they've got going on, like, bookmarking this issue. Um, I, it works fine with Daredevil, I think. Um like it, actually, it works really well with Daredevil, but I think it shines when it's able to be a little bit more abstract. But 
Yeah, it's right, the, right. the art. The art is great and fantastic, but it's the story that I just really didn't like. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, I still enjoy this issue. You know what? I'm still going to give it a 6.5 because I think it's more substantial than the She-Hulk comic. So I did like reading it. So yeah, that's my rating, 6.5. Mm-hmm. Okay. I still give it like a, like a 5.8. Not even like the... 5.8? Okay. I, I like <laughs> She-Hulk better than this one. Even though okay. the ending of it was that ending. I liked the whole like mm. sort of callback to an Andrew Wyeth painting that 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 stuff mm-hmm. that was fun um, but now that I think about Josh talking about it coming out in that sort of Sandman era and like maybe it being a little too cerebral for the readers or like on purpose right mm-hmm. it gets a 5.8 okay okay fair uh, I think I'll give it a 5 I, I think Ooh. if it, I think if it was, like, if the art didn't look like this, it would be lower. I think that the the story is like really really bad for me, and the art is really really good. So it's kind of like in right in the middle at a five. Uh-huh. I, I would suggest somebody flip through the the uh, th- flip through to to see the art and the visuals, mm-hmm. but just right. skip the story because there's not much like you'll get more out of just looking at the pages than reading the story because nothing actually happens in the story. These like demons show up, Spider-Man and Daredevil punch them together and he decides to run away. That is the story. 100%. Nothing else can be said about this. So, um, yeah, a five. Oh, scathing. All right. All right. Okay. So now, uh, Josh, who's who's summarizing the last one? That's me. That's Josh. What yeah, if, that's right. Ooh. Number four. For you. Uh, what if the alien costume had possessed Spider-Man? So this, before I kind of like jump in and talk about the story, this is before there was like uh, lore and background to the symbiote. Yes. It's before any of like the rules or like how it actually works uh, was was – at play in the comics. Mm -hmm. So at this point, the only thing that's happened is uh, while on uh, the planet during secret wars, Spidey gets a new costume and it's like this living costume and it takes hold of him. And that's the black symbiote costume Mm -hmm. comes back to earth. He swings around with it for like five issues and then realizes that it's alive. And he's like, this is gross. Uh, Mr. Fantastic, take it off of me. So Mr. Fantastic does studies on it. He gets a new like cloth block black fabric costume, um, and then uh, Eddie Brock recently uh, came in contact with the symbiote, and he is now Venom. So we don't even really know anything about how Venom works. We just know that there there's like some sort of weird symbiotic relationship where um, the symbiote kind of like takes on the characteristics and like. Right. Kind of like the body of uh, whoever uh, it's attached to. Mm-hmm. So this is kind of like another universe where the symbiote works a little bit different to kind of how it works now. So uh, pretty much everything that I just said, um, it kind of recaps. Uh, Spidey <laughs> is with Black Cat. Um, and then this is kind of where we... Um, at like some point we kind of divert and we show like, Oh, what if this happened? So, so Peter is not actually able to get rid of the, um, uh, uh, get rid of it. And, uh, he kind of lives with it. And for a while he goes to like Kirk Connors for help. And then Mr. Fantastic. And he's not able to like pry it off of Spidey's body. So he kind of like holds him in this holding container. And he's like, I- I've, he like exhausts every bit of technology and idea that he has. So he's kind of stuck dipping into the whole like mystical side of, of uh, this world. So he calls his friend, Dr. Strange, Dr. Strange comes over and he's like, okay, I'm going to try and figure out what's going on. He does some like 
magic on Spidey and the symbiote trying to detach them doesn't work. It actually just ends up freeing um, Spidey. He's swinging around. Uh, he breaks up with Black Cat. She gets sad, throws her phone. Um and kind of like yells at Mr. Fantastic for not being able to help do anything. So she kind of goes back to her whatever. We catch up with the Avengers. Uh, Hulk is kind of going on this crazy rampage. Doctor Strange is about to like teleport him to someplace else where we see the hands of Spider-Man reach out and grab Hulk by his foot and uh, pulls him back out of Doctor Strange's portal. Venom... Spider-Man, the symbiote, seems really interested in Hulk. So he starts fighting Hulk and then the symbiote takes over the Hulk. And that is now the symbiote's new host. We realize, and this is kind of where it is different from how the symbiote works now, but we see that the symbiote has kind of like sapped the life and the years out of um, Peter Parker. So he's an old man. It's, it's as if he's aged 50 years at this point. Um, mm-hmm. and the symbiote, it's not like a symbiotic relationship. It's more of a, a parasite if the host isn't like a good fit. So the symbiote has like leached the life from Peter Parker and disposed of him once he's too weak. And now he's attached to the Hulk. Um, so Hulk, the Hulk symbiote kind of goes crazy bounces off we see peter parker is like an old man in um avengers mansion black cat comes and visits and is like you know sorry this all happened yada 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 the last thing that peter kind of does is he goes and visits aunt may and kind of pretends to be a co-worker of of peter's from the bugle and says his last goodbyes to Aunt May. And they look like the same age at this point. Um, uh, we cut back to Avengers Mansion a few days later. And Peter is found dead in his laboratory. Oof. And he leaves the Avengers. Uh, the last final like plans of like this tool to help fight the symbiote. So Reed Richards... Reed Richards makes this like weapon that is supposed to completely destroy the symbiote, not just um, like stun it or detach it from its host. So Reed and the Avengers all team up and Thor as well. He stops his fight with Surtur or whoever to come and help. Um, They start fighting each other. They end up calling Black Bolt in to... Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. They start fighting each other and Thor is able to overpower Hulk and the symbiote actually attaches to Thor now. And there's they're kind of like no match for Thor symbiote. So they call on uh, Black Bolt, who uses his powers of like shout to disturb the symbiote <laughs> with sound and detaches it from Thor. And then just as... Um, Mr. Fantastic is about to like capture the symbiote to study it or release it back to space. Um, Black Cat shows up and takes the weapon from Mr. Fantastic and destroys it and actually just flat out kills the symbiote as she kind of like walks off into the distance. And that's where we leave this issue. It's a lot of stuff happens in in just one issue. Um, It really feels like you need to know this story pretty well and these characters to Mm. feel like this has any impact because it just goes at such a fast pace so many people are introduced and kind of like leave um i think it would have been a much better issue if the symbiote maybe didn't jump from hulk to thor and like do this like weird like jumping from host to host thing mm-hmm. at the end mm-hmm. and they just kind of had this like one threat that uh that was created that peter like peter's last uh, act of like creating this weapon would help the avengers fight this like ultimate threat and not this like kind of chase scene i even kind of liked that black cat was like a uh, a major 
character in this one and then by the end she destroys the the symbiote um as like an act of revenge against her spider mm. um especially at the time too she encouraged spider-man <laughs> to keep the symbiote costume and like she liked the the black edgy look so she kind of like maybe feels guilty about this whole situation so her getting revenge is kind of cool i like the idea i just don't I can't put my finger on what exactly it is that just doesn't work about this issue. Well, okay, can I make a guess? Uh, okay, first sure. of all, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay, I know all the backstory, blah, blah, blah. I know I know how What If is supposed to work. Ideally, What If takes a story that happened and it picks a point to diverge from the original, right? Mm -hmm. In this story, I have to read, let's see, one, two, three... Four, five, six, seven. Uh, is it seven? I, I, I don't even know how many pages because here's the problem. I don't know where the story diverges and that's a huge freaking problem. It should be on page two is where the story, like they should set up. Here's what happened in the original. But you're, you're going through at least five pages. Like, I actually have to go back and reread. Like, where's the point where it diverges? That, to me, is is crappy writing. Uh, the fact that it, there's, like, five pages of recap, first of all, is garbage. But also the, the fact that I don't know where the divergence is is another huge problem. Uh, once the story gets going, it's a little... It's, it's okay. But, again, I'm looking at the pages. I see tons of uh, narration instead of just... And I'm not saying narration is bad, but this narration is not good. No. Um, it's not. And then, like, I like the dynamic. I, like, Black Cat's character is maybe the only good thing I liked in this book. The fact that she has kind of, like, her own uh, agenda, her own goal. But, again, you're reading... Like, look at this. Digital page. What is this? 10? What the hell is going on in this page? Narration, 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 flashbacks, crossovers. It, it's garbage. Like, this is an example of a badly written and badly drawn comic. And then I'm reading the story, by, and, and I do admit I started skim reading because it was so badly written. And then all of a sudden, the twist is, or one of the twists, is that Peter Parker ages, which, like Josh pointed out, is not part of the current mythos, right, of mm -hmm. uh, the symbiote. Which, again, I didn't even think it was interesting. Like, it wasn't even a good idea. Then Peter Parker dies. They have the funeral. Who gives a shit? <laughs> then Mr. Fantastic gets the idea. And then, and then now it's possessing the Hulk. Now it's possessing Thor. Oh, you Which didn't is not the like how long his hair got when he possessed <laughs> Thor? It, I think the only other good thing that happens in this book is that Black Cat... I mean, the idea with Black Bolt was okay, but it wasn't mm -hmm. great. And then when Black Cat comes in at the end, at least it was... It's like, again, that's her character, and she's on her own trajectory. That was cool. But other than that, I thought this issue was really bad. It's probably the worst comic we've read in... A couple years. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. But yeah, I thought it was terrible. Uh, G.I. Julie, what did you think? I mean, it was alright. It wasn't the best. But it was definitely... Okay. I... Ugh. I can't say much more than what you both have already kind of expressed because I feel the same way. However, I can diverge from something Michael said earlier, which is he didn't like the art is terrible. I liked the art or you said it was poorly drawn. I don't mm -hmm. think it was poorly drawn at all. I think it was well drawn. However, the storytelling was non-existent. Like visual storytelling is kind of non-existent. Right. It was there were there were like moments of um like really Cool, like cool looking things but when he oh my god scan like the page 18 where Mr. Fantastic has the apparatus as I called it <laughs> and it's supposed to be one of those like flashy pages you see like Photon and Thor and Vision and like everyone like kind of all around him in a flying it's like one of those flying super group yes. poses it's god awful it's garbage it's, it's like terrible. yeah it's like a teenager drew it exactly well, I mean, well, no, it's it's like somebody who's never drawn that before. But the the, the anatomy's fine. The poses are great, but like the composition is terrible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's like a lot of like really cool stuff, but there's a lot of really weird stuff. And also when I 
my first impression when I when I read what the what if was because you're like I don't want to pre-review the comics <laughs> but uh you can probably skim read the what if and I was like oh we get a what if I love what ifs no I don't love all what ifs this is in the pile of junk it's like yeah. what if the alien costume had possessed Superman and I was like but it did Spider-Man but yeah exa- I know Wait, what that's I what's think? confusing what you, you said Superman, Superman but yeah <laughs> You know no, but you're I mean. right. It's like <laughs> that's what I mean. Is you're right. It's like, but it did possess Spider Man, in like in like issue two fifty nine or whatever. So it's not really that fascinating a premise because it kind of already happened. Yeah, it would have been yeah. better if they just had like Thor, um, get it on during Secret Wars. That's where right. that's where it the difference is. Yeah, it started at Secret Wars with who had it first. Mm-hmm. Or even right. Mr. Fantastic, like that could be an interesting idea. Like he goes to himself, obviously, for help, and he thinks he's able to like outsmart it and do these tests by himself. And then that's where his kind of like hubris, right. his like combination with it, yeah. uh, with the symbiote takes over. And then he, then it jumps to like Hulk or Thor who, mm-hmm. or yeah. whoever. But it doesn't like the catalyst here to answer your question, Mike, is. <laughs> Black Cat says, hey, you don't seem yourself. Why don't you go to the doctor? That's where the divergence is. Black so this Cat is- says on page four is, is the is the divergence. Okay. Black okay. Cat says, you don't seem yourself. You're not as turned on when I kiss you. You should go to the doctor. Mm-hmm. So he's like, okay, I will. So he goes to Kirk Connors to get a cat scan. And that messes with the symbiote. Which makes it angry and like it takes over Peter's body and won't detach. Oh, sorry. To be fair, it does actually say in the narration. Yes. It says this one such it... reality diverges on a fateful day. Okay, you're right. They at least make that clear, but jo- it's Josh's it's not good. <laughs> yeah, Josh's, <laughs> Josh's suggestion of where the divergence should happen is actually a really good mm. suggestion because. Like for the story, whatever the story is to be effective, they recap the entire Black Suit saga, mm-hmm. which is you annoying. don't even need to. Yeah, just that should have been. Oh, like okay, this is uh, this is like a an eighties comic kind of thing. They they should have summarized it in one paragraph on page one. This is what happened. That's what happened. That's what happened. But in our story, and that's it. Just start the story. Mm-hmm. These first four pages are garbage. Yep. Oh, anyway, makes me angry. And you know, the thing is, is I don't mind that like, what if is kind of a testing ground for amateur, like not amateur, but um, like new talent. Like, okay, we're not gonna waste, you know, Todd McFarlane on a what if, but we'll throw Mark Bagley on there, fine. And Danny Fingeroth had done some Web of Spider-Mans. That's actually where we came across him. But again, like get the editor in there and just rewrite it. Do a second draft. It's just brutal, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, mm-hmm. get it together, Craig Anderson. <laughs> Sorry, is yeah, he the editor? I yeah. I think it's kind of a fun idea. Um, I like that. I I disagree with Mike on this one point. I like that. Um, I like the idea of the symbiote taking life away from Peter. And him becoming like an old man, like it's just sucking away the energy mm-hmm. from him. And then he dies because, because because of it. And then like the last thing he does is he doesn't go and spend time with his family or the woman that he loves. He decides to figure out how to stop this thing. And that's literally mm-hmm. the last thing he does. So I, I, I like that concept. Um, I like the idea of like exploring what would happen if the symbiote attach itself to other beings that's really mm-hmm. great it's just really poorly executed right yeah yeah uh now i just want to quickly point out mm-hmm. that this is issue three of what if if you jump ahead to issue 105 you will experience the first appearance of spider girl mm. yeah Spider Girl started out as a what if story by Tom DeFalco, Ron Friends, and Bill Sinkevich. So that was definitely a good issue. As far as what's in between, it's a grab bag. There's, you know, every issue is by a different writer and artist. So there's probably some good ones. 
definitely some bad ones. And this is volume two, we should point out. Volume one started, I think, in the 70s. So if you want to mm. go back to the classic ones, that's what you go back to, the 70s. So, oh boy. So I am going to give this issue, I'm not kidding, a 0. 0.5 out of 10. It could be the worst <laughs> comic we've ever reviewed. I really hated it. I be. I don't Josh. think it's the worst. I don't think it's the worst. Com- there, there's definitely. Do you remember that? Do you remember the Defenders issues we read? Ooh, you're gonna put those were Defenders above this. Those were bad. Yeah, those were, those bad. were rough. Yeah. At least you could. Uh, at least you know who all the characters are, and, and yeah. at least a little bit of what's going on. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, but it wasn't good. I would probably <laughs> say a four. <laughs> okay, it, it, it was a bad issue. Um, yeah some fun ideas but uh, it just doesn't work for me the way that they told the story yeah the divergence was weird Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i do agree with josh that the soul sucking the actual life sucking was cool because that is a yeah that's a thing that like you know you want to see in what if Mm -hmm. you know different it it makes sense (laughs) for this like symbiotic relationship yeah. That it like if it's not mutual, then one is going to overpower the other. Like that's a really great idea, mm-hmm. um, especially at this time when there wasn't all this like lore and story around the symbiote and venom and all that. So mm-hmm. it's just really strange yeah. that like when Hulk, like they, it wasn't consistent. So when it leaves Hulk's body for Thor, Hulk is Bruce Banner is fine. Like yeah, okay. I know, I'm not sure, but whatever. Bye. I give it a four. <laughs> four? <laughs> four? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I I kind of like, I, I liked the, I, I would have liked the idea of the story and where it was headed if it wasn't the, uh, just like annoyed the whole time. <laughs> right. <laughs> so. Yeah. I know that it seems like we hate these books, but it comes from a place of love. Yes, mm. because yeah, we I love like the Hulk. idea. <laughs> yeah, like I want this. Get us, yeah, like I want this to be good, right? Mm-hmm. We want it to be good. It's just not good. <laughs> yeah, you. Know, I'm really enjoying reading them anyway, regardless of whether they're good or not. Like, For I'm not sure. mad about having to read them. Sometimes I. It's am, a good. But... It, yeah, it's like a good study. Yeah. Yeah, this one was rough to read, but it's fun to talk about. Yeah, for sure. Of course, of course. Mm-hmm. Um. And then, yeah, She-Hulk was a nice, fun, easy read, I found. And then Daredevil, nothing happened, so that was easy to read. That's true. <laughs> and then What If was just, like, half of the book was already something that happened, so. Yeah, that's another thing, too, I find with this issue. it's There's a lot of people talking. There's a lot of just And there's a lot of narration. Yeah. Oh, it's terrible. And the narration could be fine. Because it, it's told through the watcher. If there wasn't as much dialogue, you know what I mean. Like, right? Tell it as if it's like a storybook, and you can just kind of have visuals to go along with it. Mm-hmm. That would maybe work for this like vibe in this type of story. But that's not the case here. <laughs> it's really boring. All this narration. It sucks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, bef- I mean, before we go on to what we're reviewing next week should we Mm -hmm. mention the request that we got oh did we get a request we did um over from paul to mail at (gasps) comicbooksyndicate.com oh it's a comment actually on here Mm. comes the spider cast number 150 Mm. The request goes something like this. Read J.M. DeMatteis's issues of Maximum Carnage. Then read two other issues not scripted by him. With that experiment, one can easily determine why J.M.D. was the best Spidey writer of the 80s and 90s, with the exception of Roger Stern. I feel like someone's throwing the hat in the ring. You know... It's funny because through the magic of the internet, I've met, you know, I've uh, come across a lot of people that are like older than me that like the way that I look at 90 Spidey, there are people that look at 80 Spidey that way. They're like, I stopped reading Spider-Man at mm-hmm. number 100, you know, whatever. I think it's all crap after that. But um, there's definitely a group of people that only know J.M. Demetrius from Defenders. So they think he's just one of the worst writers in the industry. And for me, I know J.M. Demetrius from Justice League from Craven's Last Hunt, 
Mm -hmm. from writing episodes of uh, the Justice League cartoon, right? Like uh, Moonshadow, like he's gone on, like his career is still thriving. So he's obviously a good writer, but yes, he did have a rough start. <laughs> but uh, but in the <laughs> 90s, really yeah, we should point out. landing now though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But in the 90s, yes, he did uh, Spectacular Spider-Man with Sal Buscema. Mm -hmm. And if you're gonna read 90s Spidey, that's probably the best one. I'll agree with that. Mm -hmm. He wrote, quite a bit of spidey at the beginning of us uh beginning of the 80s too oh, right oh you mean those marvel team-ups that we yeah. hate so much that was yeah. almost all him yeah. so yes he had a very rough start <laughs> i don't know what happened maybe he pff, stopped eating subway or something uh, i don't know anyway. yeah it, those those <laughs> issues were also just big commercials so i mean yeah anyway know, i i feel like i could forget Give him for that. Right. Yeah, I mean, if, uh, as uh, if, you have, I was. if you have specific things to say about the very specific things that we say, feel free to let us just have it. Mail at comicsandnickit.com. Right. Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. We're looking forward to it. Yeah. <laughs> that, anyway. That's you guys now. <laughs> it's you guys now. Yeah, speaking of... Let us know what you guys think about the podcast and the issues we're talking about. Uh, you can find us anywhere you can find podcasts. That's so Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, YouTube, wherever. Um, you can also find us at the Comic Book Syndicate on Facebook and Twitter. Leave us a comment. Send us a tweet. Let us know what you guys think of uh, us and the, the, the podcast. Let's keep that conversation going. And Mike, why don't you tell us what we're going to be doing next week on oh next week we are going to be reviewing three episodes of the animated series oh yes i'm so yes. excited it's going to be the return of craven uh Ooh. plus two other ones that i don't remember but cool. <laughs> our special guest is going to be none other than junk food jeff jeff kavanaugh yes. who you might know from 89x uh, what else would he be on? I think he's been on a TV show. He has a podcast. But there you go. Junk Food Jeff, Jeff Kavanaugh will be on our, our guest next week. Be sure to check it out. All of our episodes are at www.comicbooksyndicate.com. And until next Monday, see you later. <laughs>